Welcome to the Way to Recovery Show. I'm Pastor Greg Trout, and with me in the studio today is Brother Mike. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing great, Greg. You know, it was great to get you on the show. Your wife was on the show last week, Dr. Laura Henry Harris. That's right. Now we've got Mike Harris, <laughs> and uh, this is going to be amazing. You have an amazing story that we want to talk about, and then I may, you know, ask a few questions after that. But you went to another country and actually had a miracle happen when you got back. Tell that, us that story. Well, uh, Greg, I went to Uganda for a mission trip. This was in January of 2014. And before I went, I've got these malaria pills, and they were one-a-week pills versus one-a-day pills like I've gotten before. And I had a question, but I thought, well, it's okay. And I know that if I had not had a divine appointment on an airplane on my way from uh, Washington, D.C., uh, going towards Uganda, uh, actually to the Brussels Airport, eight-hour flight, that I, I wouldn't be sitting here today. What happened is I ended up on that flight. I was next to a gentleman that was really being kind of a jerk to me, and I was saying, well, <laughs> right. he really was. It happens on the plane. A yeah. It does, but this was worse than any I'd seen. It's almost, uh, at the time, I was just saying, Lord, don't let me take on offense. I'm going on this Christian trip. Yeah, there's that whole Christian thing. I'm going on a yeah. Christian trip. I might want to be nice to the guy. Right, yeah. and I didn't want to. I just felt like the devil was trying to right. mess things up. Right. So after a couple hours, and I won't go through all those details, but he got up and moved, and I asked the steward there, I said, is there some other place I can sit? And it ended up because of what he did, and I thank God for that thorn, because I ended up sitting next to a medical doctor who had been working for the Peace Corps in Africa for the last 10 years. Wow. While I was talking to him, it was brought up in my spirit. I know the Holy Spirit brought up about these pills. And I asked this doctor about the one a day versus one a, a week malaria pills. And not knowing what the medicine was. Uh, and the doctor, I'll never forget, he looked right at me. And he said, well, that, that, that should be okay. But he looked right at me, and this is what he said. He said, now, Mike, when you get back to the States, if within a week or two you develop flu-like symptoms, you need to get checked immediately. Mm. He said, if it's caught early and treated, it's not too bad. But if you let it go, it can kill you. When he said that, it cut right through my spirit. I knew it was a divine warning for me. Um, what that doctor and myself did not know until much later after the fact, I had in fact been prescribed the wrong malaria medicine before I was going, which was ineffective in the part of Uganda where I was going. For the strand of malaria that's in that that's area. That's in that area. That region. Did not know that, but I knew this was a divine warning. I went for two weeks on the uh, mission trip with friends. I did not mention it. I didn't want to speak a curse out against myself. Got back on a Sunday night. On Monday night, we met with Christian friends, and I told them a longer version of this divine warning that I had, this divine appointment on this plane, I wasn't sick at all. I felt great. Mm -hmm. I didn't get sick till a week later on Tuesday, the second week. After you got back. After I got back. And he had said, if within a week or two you develop flu-like symptoms, and it was like etched on my brain what he had told me. And I started getting fever and shakes. And I thought, could I have malaria? And uh, then my wife, who hears from the Lord Wednesday morning, she's journaling and she writes down, the Lord tells her, Laura, pack a suitcase. I will help Mike if he will let me. Mm. Get your uh, clothes washed, go to the laundromat if you have to, and get your bills paid. And that's because our washer was out due to a freeze while I've been gone. She goes to the laundromat, washes all her clothes, starts packing the suitcase, all these things. But uh, I looking back at the time, we thought the Lord was maybe sending her somewhere, but he told my wife the next morning, I will help Mike if he will let me. Thursday morning, she's praying, Lord, please don't let me miss what you have for me. And the Lord said, Laura, pack your suitcase and zip it and get your bills paid today. So she had a suitcase packed Thursday morning, not knowing where she was going, in her, in her closet, but for the first time in her life, she had counted out and packed six outfits, six pair of underwear, six pair of socks, not knowing where she was going. I ended up being in the hospital six Very days. Very specific. Six days. And so uh, so by Thursday morning, I got I went home sick Wednesday, and then Thursday morning about 11 o'clock, I go to my doctor's office. And I go up to the lady at the front desk, and I said, she says, may I help you? And I said, yes, I need to get checked for malaria. <laughs> well, uh, you know, at a local doctor's office, yeah. you know, does that sound normal? Uh, pardon me, but, you know, I'd like to get checked for flu maybe, but not malaria. Right. This That's was, not normal. This was at the end of January at the height of flu season. Yeah. So she looks at me a little puzzled and says, well, we'll check you for the flu too. I said, that's fine, but I need to get checked for malaria. Yeah. They sent me to the hospital, drew blood to check for malaria, did a flu swab. They called me back on the phone in an hour, negative for the flu. I found out later they had told them the blood test might not be back until Monday or Wednesday of the next week. Mm. Um, and that becomes sort of important towards the end, I guess. But 
So I thought, okay, I've got flu-like symptoms and I don't have the flu, I know what's going on here. So then by Friday morning, I'm sicker, my wife calls our doctor, he, they check around, calls back, says, you need to get Mike to a teaching hospital immediately. About the time we get to UK to go to the emergency room, we get the call, it, the test was positive for malaria. Turns out that I had the worst kind of malaria you can get, most likely to kill you, and multiplies mm. three times faster than other malarias. I ended up in the hospital, the only hospital in Lexington, Kentucky that had the medicine I needed uh, and got my first dose of the medicine about 12, 30, 1 o'clock Saturday morning. And so uh, while I was there, the Lord healed me. Um, by Monday, the doctors had fear on their face. Uh, when they came in, uh, they came in and said my oxygen was so low a couple times that I should either be unconscious or incoherent. They put oxygen on me. Later, they brought a mask put on me. It just wasn't looking very good. But um, the Lord was in it and used it to teach me some valuable lessons that I needed to, to learn. Mm -hmm. um, the, type of, the reason why I think I wouldn't have been here is because the type of malaria I had, here's what I looked it up to see about it. At, they're in your kidneys or liver, one, it incubates for seven or eight days, then out into your bloodstream comes 25 to 40,000 parasites. They go into your red blood cells. They incubate for 48 hours, then they blow those up, and out of each one of those comes eight to 10 new parasites, eight to 25 new parasites. Oh my God. Let's say 10. So here was my, here's the course I was on. My first blow up experience, we know from facts that, are, that happened later, my first blow up experience on, happened on Tuesday. Remember, it's every 48 mm -hmm. hours. Right. So on Tuesday, I went from at least 25,000 to 250,000 parasites. Mm. I had fever and shakes on Thursday where it went to at least 2.5 million uh, parasites in my red blood cells. And so my schedule of events would have been by Friday, I mean Saturday night, 48 hours later, it, they'd have blown up and I'd had at least 225 uh, million parasites and by Monday, I would have had at least 250 million parasites in 250 million of my red blood cells ready to blow up two days later. It's so exponential. I mean, yeah. it just chokes you up quick. Quick, and you die. You you die from not having enough oxygen. Right. And right. so basically, it suffocates you out. Right. Asphyxiates you. Right. And so that's what was happening. Uh, a prayer warrior of my wife, um, April, came up. She knew Laura was concerned, mm -hmm. and she came up on Monday. They were going to pray all night Monday night. Uh, stay up all night and pray and, and try to break this thing off and um, during the middle of it in April here from the Lord too she, come, she came over by the bed and looked at me and said Mike I hear the Lord saying he wants to hear you cry out right and so I cried out peace came over the room we all went to sleep I woke up the next morning it felt great uh, they, the doctor said it was a miracle they couldn't believe it they couldn't believe it. Tuesday how I looked how I was from Monday and then uh, the Lord showed me how he's in control because I had the oxygen, I'm laying in my bed, to this side is my wife and April sitting in two chairs and over here is the monitor, it's sitting at 92. On, on Monday night I had prayed for my oxygen to go up to 97 because I'd only seen it up to 96 and that was with oxygen on. I don't know why I prayed 97 but I did. But as about five doctors and two nurses were walking in the door to talk to me that Tuesday morning, my oxygen was at 92 and this is what I saw about like this, 91, 90. 89, 88, 87, 86, 85, and it went down to 85 and stopped. I'll never forget any of this because it's like etched in my memory. Sure. Uh, and I'm sitting there thinking, I feel I didn't feel any different, was, was not doing anything different, but I'm thinking, I want to get out of here. My very first thought was, I don't think I can deep breathe and hold it enough to get it back up in the 90s. That was me trying to fix it. You know, right. I found that the Lord was showing me, I'm a fix it man, like a lot of men are. We try to fix our <laughs> right. own problems rather than calling on the higher power that we need to go to. Right, right. And my second thought was, well, if I do that, these doctors are going to see me doing that and that's going to look weird. And so that was my attempts of myself trying to help my situation. Yeah, your own hands. My, own hands. my own hands. I had those two thoughts just instantaneously, how am I going to fix this? And I remember thinking, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I closed my eyes and I just briefly, just while they were standing there talking, I closed my eyes and I just said in my, to my heart, I said, Lord, please take it back to the 90s. I opened my eyes and looked over, doing nothing different. And this is what I saw. 86, 87, 88, Hallelujah. 89, wow. 90, 91, <laughs> 92, 93, 94, 95, 96. Went up to 96. 
three times while the doctors were in there, it went to 97. Did they shake the machine? What's going on with the machine? <laughs> well, they didn't see it, luckily. They were, they were not watching. Now, I can wow. see it, and my two witnesses, my wife and April, they are all seeing it's down you in the mid-80s. It, yeah. We all saw it, and then... The people it, that need to see it saw it. Saw it. it. Yes, and then two more times after that, a nurse came in. It was up in the 90s. It'd go back in, down to the 80s, and I'd say, Lord, please take it to the 90s. and went back up. So Lord showed me he's in control. It was very humbling to think that the Lord would think enough about me to send me a divine warning on that plane to save my life. And I think he's doing that to everybody right, right. now. Here's a divine warning. Even if it's don't get on that drug, don't try that, don't do that. He's speaking. He's using other people to speak to his people if they'll just listen. That's right. And those little things that cut us to the to the bone, like you said, you know they're from God. Even if it's a dream or vision, yes. you know it's from God, and you better take heed. Right. Because He's trying to help you. But it really got my attention. It changed uh, the way I feel about God. About uh, it grew you as a Christian. It Your grew faith. Me. My faith has really went 89, grown. 90, yes. 95, 100, whatever. But I have to say, one of the things that uh, I guess the testimony I haven't said yet out of it is, I mean, the Lord gave us a specific scripture my wife and I we were in this isolation room because they was checking to see if I had TB and all these things all right and we were just worshiping and praising the Lord and reading scripture and I'm laying in the bed and my wife Laura looks over at me and says you know what we're gonna have to do don't you we're gonna have to start tithing off of all of our businesses and stuff off the top you wow know, 10% off the top now we're going radical yeah, and so as she, as she describes it, as soon as she said that, a look of fear came over my face. <laughs> yeah. And the Lord yeah. told my wife, said, just leave him for a while. So she said, I'm going to get some coffee. So she left for about 30 minutes, and I don't know what happened while she's gone, but when she came back, I said, we have to do it. We yeah. have to do it. And you got convinced. And we have some businesses, and I have a general manager at one of the businesses. Laura says I was gray as could be, and but we got, got out in the... Uh, that Friday, I think, or Thursday or Friday, I got in the car and then driving home, we was going by a, a radio station that we have and, and we went in and I sat down with the general manager, Laura and I both, and I said, starting now, when you make a deposit, write a check to go for 10% right. of whatever the deposit is. Mm -hmm. And then the look of fear went from my face to the general manager's <laughs> Transference. face. Transference. 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 But praise God, it has yeah. really, uh, the Lord has blessed us. We've been faithful in that. And I just thank him for my life and what he means to me. What, what a testament. I, I got to throw in a confirmation yeah, here. Yes. Because we're running out of time. But, you know, I, I can share in this story because uh, the Lord had impressed upon me to go pray for you. Well, I thought it was the Lord. I had been impressed to go pray for you because I heard it from other people. So the first thing I thought is I'm going down there and I'm going to pray over Mike. And because I believe in healing. Now, we've done that before and the Lord has blessed me. But I, I got in the car and got down the road, and then the Lord wouldn't let me do it. And I come and told you this, yes, if you remember. Right. And, and I didn't know about the other prayers going on or what had been told to you uh, from Laura's friend, April, or anything like that. But he wouldn't let me go pray for you. And the reason being was because you would have put more faith in that prayer, and he was leading you through that. Yes. And he didn't want anybody else to get the credit for that right? but him. And that's what he's getting today. And so... Yeah. That's Actually, I remember you started yeah. to come twice, two twice, different times. Twice. The Lord said, "Yeah, told you, I'm he's stubborn. okay." I yeah. the first time. He said, he "He's o that. he's okay," or something like yeah, that. Yeah, he yeah. The Lord told me, "said he, I've got this. He's just fine." And I turned that car around in some old driveway, I almost got stuck in, and then went back to the house. That's right. The second time. I remember when you called. And, uh, and afterwards, we talked. Yeah, I called, and you know, because still, I still questioned it, because you know what? You question the voices. Was that the Lord leading me away, or was that the enemy that got to me? Right. And now I've left my buddy hanging. Right. You know. And I, I truly believe that the Lord, because I love you to death and I knew you're a great prayer warrior, but if you had come and prayed over me and I was healed, I really believe I'd have put more faith in your prayers for me than April come to me and right. saying, Mike, I hear the Lord saying he wants to hear you cry out. And he had told my wife, I will help Mike if he will let me. We have free will. We have to make those choices. And I just thank God that I made the choices I did while he gave me that opportunity in the hospital. What an amazing story. I believe that you're out there listening today and this story has touched your heart. You've maybe had the same experience, you know. Uh, give us a call. Maybe you're struggling with some addiction today or something else and you need healing. Uh, ask God. God's in control. Yes. Pray to God right now to heal your body of whatever it is. And we'll share in the fellowship with you and in that prayer in Jesus' name. Thank you for coming to the show, Mike. God bless God you. God bless you.
Welcome back to The Way to Recovery. Uh, you know, Mike's story is so powerful. And of course, uh, Mike and Laura that we had on last week, Dr. Uh, Laura Henry Harris, um, be sure to, to, to Google her and, and get those books that she has about the kingdom and, and, and other books that will just really bless you. But this is her husband. But he had a, a miracle and also a divine appointment uh, and even intervention, if you will, on a plane, uh, you know, going to uh, Africa. And so coming back, you know, and, and, and the story, you, you watch this, his testimony. I mean, what a powerful uh, indicator of how God can move and intervene in our life and prophetically give us a warning that something's gonna happen later and you need to take heed and, and take notice and listen. So maybe you're going through something today and you need a word from the Lord. I pray that someone comes up to you and speaks a word to you or maybe this is the word for you today. Uh, I believe that if you're watching it probably may be or for someone else that you can share it with. But you know, if, if you're dealing with something uh, that, that, that God uh, is trying to help you with, maybe you should listen to some of the people that God has surrounded you with Amen. To help you get through that. So, uh, but you will, you will, like Mike, I believe you'll know when it's God speaking through somebody. Uh, your spirit will will pay attention to that. But one of the greatest uh, 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 examples that we have of of someone uh, being de, uh, of a divine appointment, obviously, um, is with the angels that come and visited Mary. Then you had the shepherds and the angels, or the angels that visited the shepherds. The shepherds then visited Jesus. Do you see what's happening here? God uses those divine appointments, amen, to, to, to lead, guide, direct. He can use dreams, visions. He can use other people uh, to teach us and to guide us. But anyway, um, so they all come, you know, uh, when Jesus was born. And, and, and then we have the Levitical law that says that you take a child that is born on the eighth day to be circumcised. And eight being the number of new beginnings, seven the number of completion. But... But Jesus, he, uh, parents took him to have that custom done. Uh, verse 23 says, It is written in the law of the Lord, Every male that openeth the womb uh, shall be called holy unto the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So they gave the sacrifice. Uh, he was circumcised on the eighth day. But then the next scripture is, is our text where we've got Simon and Anna, the prophetess, which were... Uh, before the beginning of time appointed to be there to give confirmation to the parents of Jesus, I believe. And so let's look at verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, in the second chapter of Acts, we see where the Holy Ghost came upon Peter and the other disciples, 120 and, and then was spread across the land, taking residence in us as the comforter, as the great counselor, because Jesus had ascended to the Father. Now, key point, but the Holy Spirit was already in operation in the world. There was still a Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity or the Godhead, that was still in operation uh, to create the Word. The Spirit of the Lord moved upon the waters and, and, and the faces of the deep. Uh, however you want to look at it, but the, the Holy Spirit was in operation the whole time, guiding, leading, and inspiring people even to write this Bible. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ, the Messiah. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He was confirming even at that moment who Jesus really was. Which thou hast prepared before the face of all people a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a word shall pierce through thy own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. He began, it was a divine appointment. Just like the shepherds, just like the angels. Uh, the, the angel with Mary who told her that she, you know, not to fear that, that she was going to have a child that was birthed of the Holy Spirit. Can you see the operation of the Holy Spirit working 
all through history, all through time. Uh, working in John the Baptist, you know, uh, bringing a message to the people. Working in, in Elizabeth, John the Baptist's mother, that she could be pregnant, amen, uh, where she was barren and, and infertile. And so, uh, and it was a confirmation to Mary when Mary went there. Um, she said, okay, well, if this could happen, this miracle, then surely God can have uh, an immaculate conception through me. And so, we see all these things happening. And, and sometimes, that's one confirmation with, with, the, with the shepherds and, and the angels. And, and then we have a second confirmation with, with Simon right after his birth, eight days in the temple. Uh, and then we have this other lady named Anna. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And she was a widow of about four score and four years which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that them that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child, this being Jesus, and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. And then, of course, we skip on to where, you know, Jesus is 12 and there, there, you know, there, there's, a, there's a skip there in, in Jesus' life. And I believe that, that some of the things that was there, uh, you know, there's a scripture that says, if they wrote down every miracle that Jesus done, everything that he did, amen, there wouldn't be enough pages in the world to contain them. They couldn't contain his life. And so the things that were needed, the things for redemption, salvation, and, and, and the things that we need to know uh, to govern our lives is, is here. We have, we have a complete package of everything we need in God's holy scriptures. And so uh, we need to be careful about foolish questions. Well, what about this? How does it, it contradicts itself by looking, you know, people who, who have a hard time with faith uh, seem to ask those questions, those hard questions, but God has big shoulders. We shouldn't be offended as Christians. We should try to get them in the Word and answer those questions because the answer is here. Amen. And in, in several instances we see uh, where uh, God had to send someone to confirm things. And I believe that the faith of Joseph and Mary needed confirming. I think that they needed people to confirm uh, that look, they really, this really was Jesus. This really was the Messiah. This is really what happened, amen. Because I'm sure there was some doubts even in, in their life and even as parents, you know, what would it be like to be the, the parents of, of the Savior of the world, the Messiah, amen. I, I mean, I can't imagine, I can't imagine that. But all these people coming up, they could not deny, you know, the, the important role that they played as parents, as the surrogate parents to God himself, amen. And so they, I'm sure, had to look to God the Father as, as He came in His incarnate nation uh, through Jesus, amen. And the Holy Spirit had to work with them, I'm sure, on, on a continual daily basis. And, you know, this lady, uh, she impresses me by her fastings and prayer. And, and Simon, I mean, he stayed there for, for all those years knowing that what God had told him was real. And what kind of discipline would it take to be at the temple every day? Looking for a child, you don't even know what this child looks like. Uh, maybe God gave him the ability to know, I think, through the Holy Spirit. But when he got close to Jesus, he knew who Jesus was, as many did even in Scripture, who had never met Jesus. But Jesus could walk up on the scene and people would be like, Jesus, the Son of the Most High, or, oh my gosh, this is the one that they talk about. Because Jesus, uh, you know, he knows us inside and out. And he has, he has the ability to look at our, our inner heart and our thoughts and, 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 our, and our soul and, and our motives. And so, you know, motives are important. And I think that, that God knew that Mary and Joseph would have the right motive and that they would be a great surrogate parents to God himself. And I can't imagine that responsibility that they felt. Uh, and even to the other people. And, and the, the redemption in Jerusalem that she talked about, you know, here was redemption in a package. This, this was the beginning of the redemption of Israel. This was God's redemptive plan since the beginning, since the garden, since Genesis. Amen. This was the one that would have victory over Satan on the cross and the one that, that, that would be the, the last sacrifice. You know, and I look at the sacrifice that they had to give the, by using the old Levitical laws that they would have the, the, two, uh, the pair of turtle doves or the two young pigeons and they would take those and they would sacrifice those for Jesus. But what a great uh, uh, paradox because now Jesus, the one that, that had that sacrifice given for him, would be the last sacrifice, amen, for mankind. 
as by one man named Adam, sin entered into the world, but by this other man, this God-man named Jesus, this divine uh, being, hallelujah, uh, sin was eradicated as long as we will go and ask forgiveness in repentance. Now, you know, Simon and Anna is only talked about just, just very briefly in the Bible. But the key points are, you know, uh, I, I think if we look at someone who, who has died, we look at the key points of that person who has moved on. You know, the thing we looked at, what, did they have the Holy Spirit? Were they saved? Were they devout? Uh, you know, did they have faith? It's not about whether you lived in perfection or not. It's about, did, did you pursue God? Did, if you had failures, did you bounce back? You know, so there's all these different things. But I believe that there's probably people that's out there listening right now, you, yourself, if I'm talking to you or probably many others, who need a word from the Lord. You need a divine word from the Lord. You need uh, uh, something that, that can get you to that next level with God, knowing and confirming in your spirit that you're walking in the right place. So uh, if someone comes up to you this week and says, you know what, I have a word for you, I want you to pay close attention. I want you to listen to what they have to say because you may go out later needing that word and that could be a, even a prophetic word to you, hallelujah, uh, a confirmation, a, a prophetic word. It could be a prophetic word to get you to that place that you're looking for, amen. And you know what? That tells me that there, there's a God. Uh, people have spoken to my life and when I seen those things uh, come to fruition, hallelujah, I began to say, thank you, Jesus, that you still are, are mighty and sovereign on the throne, and you're still dealing with my life. In Jesus' name. Thank you for tuning in again to the Way to Recovery Show. Remember, for your generous financial gift of $100 or more, we'll send you and your family this complete three-part DVD series. First is our exciting eight-week small group edition designed specifically for both church and home group settings. Next is our family and friends edition designed for anyone who has had a loved one struggling from addictions or addictive behaviors. Also included is the individual study series developed to encourage anyone seeking a life of recovery through the power of God's Word. Again, don't miss this opportunity to receive these dynamic DVD sets. Also, for an individual copy of any of these three series, call the 1-800 number on your screen with your financial gift to receive your copies today. Until next time, this is Pastor Greg Trout. God bless.